What makes a person, a cat, a bonobo, a dolphin, an octopus, a cockatoo intelligent? What is it that we are saying that these living organisms have or do when we say that they are intelligent? And what about things, computer programs, robots? Can they be intelligent? And if so, how? If not, why not? Today, questions such as these pop up everywhere in headlines, sci-fi books and films, in our interactions with our newest gadgets and with our pets. They come up in predictions and prophecies about a future that, depending on whom you ask, may be gloomy or the very paradise on Earth. Join us in this journey, examining intelligence in all its forms and in all the ways it expresses itself in the world, from termite mounds to cathedrals, from chatbots to robot assistants, from brains to machines to societies, and back again. We will look at how our growing understanding and power over intelligent things impacts our lives, our interactions with others, and transform the way we see ourselves. I am Dimitri Molo. And I am Aravind Bhattaje. By the Science of Intelligence Cluster in Berlin, this is Punching Cards, the podcast about all things intelligent. We live in a world in which everything is turning smart. Smartphones, smart TVs, smart fridges, smart houses, smart assistants, smart cities, smart solutions, machines, applications. Once upon a time, being smart was typically a quality that people have or lack, and that they express or fail to express with their words and actions. We tend to believe that Nobel Prize winners are smart, that some people have street smarts, that our cat is, at least when laser pointers are not involved, rather smart. And toddlers may surprise us with their cute antics and often unexpected smart answers. This smartness explosion around us has lots to do with recent developments in computer science and especially in the field of artificial intelligence. In the end, saying that someone or something is smart is a way of saying that, in some way or another, that person, animal or thing is intelligent. This sounds like progress. After all, intelligence is something that we can measure, isn't it? IQ tests have been around for decades and they seem to capture something out there in the world. People with higher IQs tend to fare better in life than people with lower IQs. But what is it that we are measuring with these tests? What is intelligence really? There are also all sorts of things that can't take IQ tests. Your cat, my smartphone, a toddler. And people often talk about forms of intelligence that have little to do with solving abstract puzzles, as people are typically asked to do in such tests. Emotional intelligence, street smarts, intelligence in sports. How, for example, not to say that Messi is an incredibly intelligent footballer? Psychologist Edwin G. Boring, frustrated by this question and bothered by the fact that we test and put a number on something that we don't quite know what it is, famously said, that intelligence is whatever intelligent tests test. Not exactly the illuminating answer we would want from decades of work by smart people on that. But that was long ago, in 1923. Well, much more recently, in 2007, a couple of researchers, Shane Legg and Marcus Hutter, collected more than 70 different definitions of intelligence that have been proposed by scientists throughout the years. Borings included. Yeah, that's not of much comfort either. Yes, intelligence is all around us, And we don't quite know what it is. But lots of smart people are working on this question now in a variety of areas, from robotics to the arts, from philosophy to engineering, working in labs, ateliers, zoos, armchairs, rainforests, studying lines of code, sci-fi scenarios, parrots, ravens, chimps, robots, and us. Yes, good old-fashioned human beings. This podcast will try to steer around the rich and perilous sea of insights, confusion, doubts, trying to make small steps forward, trying to get nearer to answering fascinating and very difficult questions. What is intelligence? How can we understand it and perhaps build it? And even if we can, should we? 
Once, not long ago, we thought that intelligence could be created by linking together huge transistors, computers the size of whole buildings even, programmed using cards with holes in them to solve problems and do math. A similar computational building, some people thought and still think, is compressed inside our skulls. Intelligence, then, is a bit like having the right punch cards at hand, as it were. And to create artificial intelligence, we have to build machines that can use those punch cards in the right way. As the neuroscientist Charles Sherrington put it, the brain is an enchanted loom where millions of flashing shuttles weave a dissolving pattern. Enchanted machines, both of them, one hard and one cold, made of silicon and code, and the other wet and soft, made of pulsating nerves, neurons in a sea of chemicals. We are, of course, long past the age of punch cards and of computers that would weigh more than an aeroplane. It's not so obvious that much else has changed since then, though. When it comes to intelligence, ours, the one that we try to embed in our machines, and the one we see in our fellow animals, much remains to be discovered. There is a huge and mysterious landscape in front of us, waiting to be explored. In this episode, we will look at how people have gone on trying to test intelligence, despite not having a clear idea of what exactly it is. We all have heard of, and some of us have even taken IQ tests. But what is the point behind them? What are they measuring? Are they any good at measuring whatever it is that they're measuring? We'll try to get some answers to these questions and some more after the break. <laughs> Welcome back to Punching Cards. We have Olga Shurigina here with us. She has recently talked to a couple of researchers about intelligence and IQ tests. Olga, thanks for joining us. Have you ever taken an IQ test? I did, back in the day, and I was quite happy about the score. And honestly, I was very lucky that nobody measured my memory. To be honest, I don't remember much about it. Okay, interesting. Lucky you. I think I saw some puzzles from these tests somewhere, but that's pretty much it. Have you ever been curious about how these intelligence tests work? Oh yes, there are lots of these tests, and I had some idea of how they worked, what's the difference, but not really in detail. I guess they must be really complicated, because, well, intelligence seems to be very complicated itself. Anyway, we recently had a chat about IQ tests with the neuroscientist John Dylan Haynes. So my name is John Haynes. I work at a place called the Bernstein Center for Computational Neuroscience at the Charité Medical School in Berlin. He is well known for his work on the neuroscience of consciousness and so-called brain reading. How come he is interested in IQ tests? He is also a principal investigator at Science of Intelligence. And he's been trying to shed some light on what intelligence is, how the brain produces intelligent behavior, and so on. But why look at IQ tests? Well, IQ tests have been one of the main ways to try and measure human intelligence, so it makes sense to look at these tests and to see whether they can tell us anything about what intelligence is. Right, so I mean these tests are supposed to be measuring intelligence. Does that mean that the people that create and use these tests have a good idea of what intelligence is? Not quite. There are different views about this, and there are sort of definition of intelligence proposed some years ago, but not everyone thinks it's helpful. This is from 1996. It's the APA task force on trying to find a definition of intelligence published in the American Psychologist Journal. And the background is that everybody had their own definition of intelligence. So they got this task force together to get people to sort this out and finally come up with a clear definition. And this is what they came up with. Individuals differ from one another in their ability to understand complex ideas, to adapt effectively to the environment, to learn from experience, to engage in various forms of reasoning, to overcome obstacles by taking thought. Although these individual differences can be substantial, they are never entirely consistent. A given person's intellectual performance will vary on different occasions in different domains, as judged by different criteria. Concepts of intelligence are attempts to clarify and organize this complex set of phenomena. My goodness, there's lots going on there. Yeah, lots of different abilities, components, caveats. You can see some things in there. So understand complex ideas. Obviously, this is about intelligence in the sense of some depth of cognitive penetration, some ability to engage in kind of complex mental representations. 
So that's one aspect. Adaptation is a big aspect in here. So that means that you are flexible. Intelligent behavior is one where you adapt to your niche that you live in, but then you move and then you shift and you learn to adapt to a different environment. That is directly related to problem solving, obviously. If my routines don't work anymore, I need to go into a problem solving mode. And when I go into this problem solving mode, I find, need to find new uh, recipes, new behaviors for the new situation. So that's directly, you could say, the, the method in which we do this adaptation to new environments. Then we have um, uh, reasoning. So kind of the, the idea that we have some level of abstraction here that we're not just directly submitted to the sensory representations that directly reflect what is there in the environment, but that we can loosen ourselves from these sensory representations and that we can also form abstraction and possibly even symbolic processes. So all these things are different ingredients in the definition of intelligence. Uh, learning is, of course, another one. So intelligent behavior is one that is able to learn. So learning would mean that you not only adapt, but that you extract some useful aspect for your future behavior from what you've experienced before. Now, I guess you might be thinking, well, what's wrong with that? I mean, intelligence sounds like something quite complicated. So is our definition, right? Right. Well, but it also makes it quite vague, doesn't it? I think the difficulty with this is that it's so generic that you can already ask whether this is different than the term cognition. Possibly you could say intelligence is the posh cognition, it's the nice cognition, the good cognition. But perhaps it's generic because our concept of intelligence, our intuitions of what intelligence is, are themselves very vague and generic. That might be part of the story, but this can become an issue if you want to solve what John Haynes called the translation problem. How should we translate the layperson's term of intelligence into something that we can usefully study in the lab? And I think that hasn't really been achieved yet. So the problem is how to do experiments that from one side are really about what people call intelligence in everyday life, but from the other are precise and clear so that the results we can get tell us something valuable. Yeah, I think that's a very good way to put it. Anyway, there are also some advantages of giving a definition that is complicated in this way. Let's listen to someone with a different perspective on this. I actually, I like the definition because uh, it, it would basically, if we had this one sentence definition of intelligence, it would play into the hands of those that that's say that there is something like the intelligence. The complex definition basically shows there are different abilities. They're all connected to each other. But picking a single ability and, and saying this is intelligence or this is intelligent behavior, that's not very smart. We have progressed quite substantially from, from this definition, not by throwing it overboard, by, but by basically putting this into a hierarchical structure. That is Matthias Ziegler, a cognitive psychologist in Berlin, who has done lots of work on IQ tests, as well as on personality traits and how to measure them. My name is Matthias Ziegler. I'm a professor for psychological assessment at the Humboldt University in Berlin. So Matthias' point is that there's a sort of organization of the components and abilities mentioned in the definition that make up intelligence. Kind of, but I think that Matthias wouldn't be so happy to talk about intelligence with capital I, though. But there is no such thing as the intelligence. If you look into the research, then intelligence is a hierarchically structured concept with a lot of different abilities that go hand in hand. So in the one of the more popular models, the cattell horn carroll model, the CHC model, you have three different levels with a G factor. That's basically that an ability that you cannot really measure or describe because it's something that binds all other abilities together. So the more interesting level is the second level. And here you have between 12 and 18 different broader abilities. And the two most commonly known abilities on this level are fluid reasoning and crystallized uh, intelligence. This goes back to Cattell and his idea was there are problems in the world you have never encountered before. So you cannot use what you've learned to solve these problems. You have to use basically what's given to you. And that is fluid intelligence. So that's the power or the mental ability you have to solve problems that contain unknown content, unknown issues. However, the more problems like this you encounter, the more you learn. And sooner or later, there will be less and less problems that you haven't encountered, at least in parts. So you can 
use what you've learned. And this is what Cattell called crystallized intelligence. So basically that means it's stuff you've learned and can apply to solve problems because you know the problem or parts of the problem um, and can use your knowledge to solve these. So when I never talk about fluid and crystallized intelligence, it's basically the, the way you approach problems. Either you can solve them because you already know how to do this crystallized or you have never encountered it, it, so you have to reason, you have to find um, the solution, you have to identify the rules in the system. That's the fluid part. Okay, so we can break intelligence down into at least two categories, fluid and crystallized, and then below them in this kind of hierarchy where there are all sorts of different abilities that are relevant. Yeah, and a part of why Matthias doesn't want to talk about the intelligence. I would shy away from two easy um, definitions that basically conceptualize intelligence as just one thing. So going back to the definition of intelligence that contains ability to understand complex ideas, adapt, learn, reason, the one that John mentioned, we can see it in at least two somewhat different ways. On one side, it's too generic and complicated, making it difficult to deal with it scientifically. On the other though, being so complicated and full of components at least recognizes that intelligence itself is a complex group of abilities. So we don't risk oversimplifying what's going on. Right, but either way, how can IQ tests really measure intelligence then? I mean, either we don't know what we want these tests to measure to start with, or what they are supposed to measure is so complicated that it's very difficult to create a test for that. Yes, one way to go then is to be skeptical of IQ tests, and I think John is, especially in the light of the translation problem. So intelligence is a word that is used to describe mental performance. Specifically, the aim is to say that intelligent behavior is, or cognition is better than non-intelligent um, behavior and cognition. But if you look into the details about how it's historically been used, it's incredibly diverse. And ultimately, um, if you look into intelligence tests, for example, it's not clear whether these intelligence tests really capture what lay people consider to be intelligent behavior. And another way to go is to embrace the complexity and try to tackle it little by little, which I think is what Matthias is suggesting. I think, though, that he and John actually agree that the single IQ test is perhaps not the best way to go. When we say we want to measure intelligence without actually specifying what we mean by this, and then we just pick any of those 80 tests and say, okay, it's, it's intelligence. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So we need a lot of specific knowledge. And yeah, it's complex. I agree. This is a complex task. But uh, why shouldn't it be? I mean, the human, human intelligence, why shouldn't it be so simple as the result of one test? That would be kind of a disappointment, wouldn't it? Matthias mentioned briefly the G factor. Isn't that the general something that IQ tests are measuring and that brings together everything involved in intelligence? Actually, as we found out talking with John and Matthias, there is a lot of debate about the G factor and what it really is. What we know, though, is that people that are better at some things tend to be better also in others. There is also a correlation between high IQ scores and several measures of success in life. The G factor, which is a way in which you can, um, uh, is, is basically based on the idea by Spearman that he looked at the um, behavior performance of pupils in school. Um, and he found that if you do classics or French or English or maths, etc., that there's a correlation. So people who are better in French are also better at music, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a general tendency like uh, for people to be better in one thing, than to be better in another thing as well. I would think that these kinds of connections between IQ scores and success in various areas of life also have to do with where and how people grew up, how much formal education they got, how many opportunities they had to flourish in the course of their lives, so things that are not so much about abilities that you have, but rather about the environment in which you live. Absolutely, especially for crystallized intelligence. That is what captures the knowledge that you have accumulated through your entire life. First of all, we have to differentiate between the specific ability that we look at. If we looked at crystallized abilities, knowledge stuff, it's very obvious 
that the that the environment depends even within one society it depends what school i go to um what job or profession i later will learn and this aspect of intelligence can change also with the technology social structure society starting to value some skills more than others uh john mentioned an example that i think every one of us can relate to we're learning different things today we're learning to navigate information rather than to store the information um and um i think only time will tell if as a culture that is something that is good or bad for us i remember that when i was little and that's not very long ago at school we would have lots of exercises for training our memory like learning poetry by heart or the dates of important historical events the names of capital cities and so on i don't know if children still do this nowadays but this is perhaps not so useful anymore Well, maybe today it seems that it's more useful to know where to find that information rather than learning it by heart. And of course, to know what pieces of information you can really trust. Anyway, these things have more to do with crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence might be much less dependent on where you live, where you grew up, what society values, and so on and so forth. The more interesting question is can we actually measure the fluid abilities or the speed abilities the, the more abstract or or um less um culture influenced um abilities across different regions of the world let's put it this way but is this the whole story i mean is this distinction between fluid and crystallized intelligence all we need to start making sense of intelligence as a whole oh there is much more at the end of the day Why think that only the kinds of things that you learn at school or that have to do with doing math or thinking quick count as intelligence? People often talk of emotional intelligence, social intelligence, and they may even be something more important for success in life, in their job, family, and so on. Although these aspects are even tricker to measure than fluid or crystallized intelligence. We do know that there are tests of emotional intelligence that are basically questionnaires. I can feel what other people feel. I can put myself into the role of other people, stuff like this. Now the research shows there's a meta analysis by um Oboyer and colleagues that shows if you have these questionnaire based measures of emotional intelligence. They do predict important life outcomes, but only if you do not control for the big 5 personality or gender differences. So in other words, these these trait emotional intelligence questionnaires, they basically pick up personality differences, not really an ability. And then there are trait or no there are ability um EI tests. So ability emotional intelligence tests. Very fancy stuff. You see a video vignette or you read a text and you actually have to say how does the person in that situation feel. Now and here comes from a test uh, construction point of view the big problem needs to be objective. Now how do we know how this person actually feels in that situation? One way to do is is you ask the person that actually was in the video, how did you feel? Now but this is only how one person in that situation would feel. Is this really objectively the truth for every person that would come into this situation? Maybe not. So you do an expert or consensus scoring, but this is it's different from having a math equation or or a number series and you have to find the the rules this is objectively true wherever you are this is always true you cannot really say the same for emotional intelligence tests even though they pick seem to pick up an ability this things between people how do we manage our relations that's still something that i guess um needs to be incorporated more solidly into into this intelligence framework and as john pointed out even though emotional intelligence has been getting lots of high lately there are still many other abilities that we may want to consider in a way or another to be intelligent the human mind breaks down into lots of different subfunctions and these subfunctions all can be better or worse you might say you have a good perceptual intelligence a good motor intelligence a good emotional intelligence a good social intelligence you could basically break this down into many different cognitive domains and for each of these you can ask what makes you better or worse from what i understand then we are pretty sure that our iq tests are getting to something out there or rather in here in our minds but it's not fully clear what that something is and besides there are all sorts of other abilities that we could also perhaps see as intelligent test or get scores for like emotional intelligence motor intelligence and so on 
although there are some serious methodological difficulties there too. Thanks for this, Olga. It's been great. But before you go, one last question. I guess that when people talk about IQ scores, there's always this idea in the background that maybe there is something that we can do to be become more intelligent and so improve our IQ. Oh yeah, absolutely. Think about all these people who think that getting very good at chess will make them or their kids more intelligent. There are also lots of apps that are supposed to help you to train your brain in various ways to improve your intelligence. <laughs> so, is there a way to train our intelligence? Well, yes and no. There are some things that you can train, but they will only make you very good at those things and little else. So, um, there is this myth that you could do brain jogging. So, uh, brain jogging in the sense that you do um, simple Sudoku tasks or crossword puzzles and things like that, and that you're going to get magically better at everything else as well because you can you're training the full ability set like a muscle. And that's not true. Actually, most training that you do is something that is incredibly task specific. So that means if you train yourself to do Sudoku, you're going to be very good at doing Sudoku, plus possibly a few other things that are involved in doing Sudokus. But the transfer will be very weak to other tasks. That's not what many people would hope, I guess. Besides, I'm not a big fan of Sudoku. <laughs> yeah, there is still some hope. Matthias mentioned that one thing we can do is to be open to new information, like learning new things, reading interesting newspapers. This kind of effort may help develop your abilities and for sure, at least, your crystallized intelligence will become better. You read this new stuff, you try to mentalize this or make a mental picture of this and integrate this into your existing knowledge. Now, if I'm not open to new things, because it's 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 difficult, you know, it, it's, it's not only fun. It, um, but if I like this, I will also talk with other people about this, challenge me again, and, and I have to make this more clear or whatever. So the more I interact with this, the more I have to engage with this on a cognitive level, which means I can maintain the, the information longer in my brain and gets connected to existing knowledge structures. And this is basically what we talked about earlier, what many of the cognitive abilities are about, processing information, information making sense of information and integrating this into our existing knowledge structures. And what I particularly like that John always recommends video games. <laughs> if only my mother knew this when I was little. Anyway, that's a good note to end on. Many thanks for the chat, Olga. My pleasure. And of course, many thanks to John Haynes and Matthias Ziegler. Stay tuned. We'll be back after a short break with more Punching Cuts. So, Arvind, would you want to take an IQ test after all you heard? <laughs> Not really. I mean, it's very interesting that results in these tests are connected with lots of life outcomes, even though we don't understand fully why this is so. But I don't think I would like to have a sort of number that tells me what I'm capable of doing. Yeah, that may feel a bit weird, like limiting. Even if you know that these tests are partial and so on, it's still a number that may influence how you see yourself. But who knows? Perhaps your IQ score is super high and can boost your confidence or even allow you to join the Mensa International. <laughs> I have no doubt about that, but better not to know, so I stay humble. What is the Mensa International though? It's a society that accepts only people with very high IQs. You have to get an IQ result among the 2% highest to get in. Yeah, I don't think that would be my thing. I guess for now, I'll just focus on getting a Turing Award for creating the first artificial general intelligence. Yes, that sounds like a good plan indeed. Do you think that what we heard today can help with that? Yeah, I think it does bring up important insights about how tough it is to really understand what intelligence is. I agree. And I think that it also helped me see how at least some of the issues with IQ tests come from the fact that it is really hard to define intelligence. Definitely. And the same goes for building intelligence, I think. If we don't really know what we are trying to build, then it's difficult to figure out whether we are going in the right direction or not. Or even if we are going in one direction at all. <laughs> right. At this point, maybe it's better if we aren't. Better to go in various directions, hoping that at least one will work. That's true, but who knows how many paths there are and how many are really good ones to follow. Maybe we are going many directions, all of which are wrong. <laughs> 
Maybe, but hopefully we are getting at least something right. Maybe we are, but there are too many things that we don't understand. Right. That's why we want to look at different places in science and philosophy to see what they can teach us about intelligence. Oh, well, that's why we started doing this podcast after all. So perhaps we can tell the listener a bit more about what's coming next this season? Sure. So this season, we will try to get an overall view of intelligence taken very broadly, and we'll talk with people from lots of different fields in science and philosophy. In our next episode, we'll be focusing on animal intelligence. So not counting humans. Yes, exactly. We are also animals, but it's kind of long to say all the time, non-human animal intelligence. Makes sense. Anyway, sounds great. Yeah, when talking about intelligence, people often mean human intelligence, but there are so many fascinating things that non-human animals can do. So taking a look at them can help us to understand intelligence in general. Really fascinating stuff. Anyway, let's not anticipate too much from the next episodes. We have to keep some suspense. I promise. No spoilers. Great. So, I mean, the basic idea this season is to try and understand better what intelligence is, keeping an open mind about the places where we can discover useful things and people that may have interesting things to say. That's right. So just to give a brief idea, we are going to talk to people working with cockatoos, with chimps, but also with building and testing machine intelligence in programs and robots. And with people working with intelligence in insects like ants and bees. Yes, collective intelligence. It's amazing what ants, termites and bees can do together. We also look at some even more controversial research. Are plants intelligent? Fungi? Lately, some people have been arguing for that. That's true. I think it all goes back a bit to the question of what intelligence is for. Why did evolution lead to organisms that are intelligent? What's the point of it? We we'll also be covering that question here in the podcast. Yeah, definitely. And don't miss the next episode. We'll be talking about birds creating and using tools and lots of other impressive stuff non-human animals can do. Cool. I'm looking forward to that. For today, though, I'd say that's all. We'll be back soon with more fascinating, surprising and controversial conversations about all things intelligent here at the Punching Cards podcast. Before we close for today, some intelligence trivia. Did you know that for several decades, average IQ scores have gone up? which is known as the Flynn effect, but the average IQ score remained 100? That may seem paradoxical, but the IQ average at 100 is just a convention. What happens is that when a new version of an IQ test is introduced, the average score of test takers gets fixed at 100. But if those same people take older versions of the test, the average score is several points higher. It's not clear what explains this, but better education and nutrition are probably crucial. We don't know if the IQ scores are going to increase further, and it seems that in some places this phenomenon has stopped and even reversed. We don't quite know why or if that's really happening. Anyway, even if it were, brain training apps are probably not going to help much. And with that, see you next time at Punching Cards, the podcast about all things intelligent. Punching Cards, the podcast about all things intelligent, is a production of the Science of Intelligence Cluster in Berlin, part of the Excellence Initiative of the German Research Foundation. The podcast is produced, scripted, and coordinated by Arvind Bataje, Dimitri Coelho Malo, Benjamin Lang, Nicholas Roth, Olga Shurigina, and Solveig Steinhardt. Editing by Valeria Beccattini. The music was composed and performed by Solveig Steinhardt and Dimitri Coelho Malo, and mixed and produced by Arvind Bataje. You can find and follow our podcast on Spotify and Apple Music and all your favorite podcast platforms. For show notes, links to additional material, more information, and to contact us, visit www.scienceofintelligence.de slash punching cards or follow Science of Intelligence on Twitter.